Well, hello, I'm uh, Pastor Scheidbach, Lighthouse Baptist Church in Santa Maria, California. I'm your brain masseur. We're going to talk this, uh, uh, in this show a little bit about uh, what's going on with, with Russia and uh, what's going on with this Black Lives Matter outrage. They kidnapped that young man, bound him, and uh, tortured him. Can you imagine that? All right. Here's a uh, scripture verse I think that would be helpful to us right now. Our countrymen uh, need to need some guidance through a very difficult time that's developing. And I think this passage in Ezekiel would be a very important passage for all of us Christians especially to bear in mind. And uh, as Issachar's, you know who Issachar is? Issachar is one of the tribes, one of the 12 tribes of Israel. And Issachar had a reputation in, uh, in the community there as being people who understood what Israel needed to do. They had discernment of the times and could apply the wisdom of God uh, to guide them through whatever situation was going on. Now we as believers have the Holy Ghost in us, we have the Word of God, we have the Lord's Church, the pillar and ground of the truth, and so we need to be, uh, for our community, the Issachars for our generation. And so let me give you something from the Word of God that our countrymen need desperately right now. It's in the book of Ezekiel. Let's look at a few verses in here. First, Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4. Behold, all souls are mine, as the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Now, there's a point God's making with that, and that point begins to come out uh, very clearly at verse number 14, where it says, Now, lo, if he beget a son, that is, if a father begets a son, that seeth all his father's sins which he hath done, and considereth and doeth not such like, that hath not eaten upon the mountains, neither hath, and he goes on, but let's get to that portion that really has application here, verse 16, neither hath oppressed any, now that would include slavery, stuff like this, neither hath oppressed any, hath not withholding the pledge, neither hath spoiled by violence, you know, violating somebody's rights uh, by encroaching upon them uh, through aggression. And then, but hath given his bread to the hungry, and hath covered the naked with a garment, and so on. And then this, this thought continues on in Ezekiel, and then it comes right to the point I want to offer right now. Look at verse 20. The soul that sinneth it shall die, the son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. All right? Neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. And, and it goes on. The point here is that, according to God's law, listen, we don't hold the children responsible for the sins of the father. Uh, we don't hold the father responsible for the sins of a mature son. And so, this whole idea uh, in, with the Black Lives Matter movement, that they're going to hold white people generally accountable for what some, and actually relatively few, white people did a hundred or more years ago. Well, it's just absurd. And that kind of thinking needs to stop, and we need to take the Word of God and teach our neighbors the truth about this kind of thing, and of course appeal to their conscience in that regard. All right, so let me just, you know, I didn't have time this morning. I've been sick, dealing with cold and all that. And uh, so I gave my body a little more rest than I usually do on Saturday morning. So I didn't have the time to go through my show notes for the brain massage and call out those parts and pieces that we use for our, our video ministry, uh, our YouTube outreach. So bear with me. I'm just going to pick through my notes here from the show and uh, share some thoughts with you. I think it'll be helpful. Let's talk a little bit about uh, this thing going on with uh, those in our country trying to blame Russia uh, for Hillary's failure to win the, uh, win the White House. So Russia continues to lead in the news, doesn't it? The progs, you know, the progressives, including John McCain, by the way, <laughs> continue to do all that they can do to convince us that Russia's alleged interference in our recent election is what kept Hillary out of the White House and kind of sent her to the outhouse. The outrage over this is comical. 
I mean, really, it is a joke. Obama, you remember, was dismissive of Russia's interference in our elections before he was outraged by it. <laughs> it's a pattern with these guys, you know. Uh, he dismissed it as old news. Uh, he said it's something that they've been doing since, well, I think he referred back to the Cold War, and so, surely, in our experience, it goes back as far as uh, old loose shoe Khrushchev. But later, apparently, Obama changed his mind about this and decided that this is a matter of national security. Yeah, and just as soon as Obama did that, I noticed the MSM, mostly stupid media, jumped in there, and, uh, and then John McCain joined in with him, <laughs> got on board with all this, and started harping about Hatgate. <laughs> well, they haven't called it Hatgate yet, but wait for it. <laughs> I know these people pretty well. And this is where they're going. They're going to try to find some way to concoct a connection between Trump's people and Putin's people getting together on this plot to hack the DNC computers and get some muck on Hillary they could use to derail uh, her campaign and all of this nonsense. And when they do, oh, it'll be Hatgate. You can bet on that. Of course, earlier, you know, when allegations that Russia hacked the Pentagon and Homeland Security, well, they didn't hack into the top secret stuff. They hacked into the lower level, uh, less protected email accounts is what they actually did. But anyway, still, don't you think hacking the Pentagon and Homeland Security is like more important than hacking the DNC? <laughs> well, not to those people. It's, uh, because when they hacked the Pentagon and, and the uh, Homeland Security email accounts, uh, about a year and a half before the election, by the way, uh, Obama minimized it. Yeah, supposedly Russia did this as a way to retaliate for Obama's sanctions that he put against Russia because of their invasion uh, of Ukraine. And uh, so Obama minimizes it. He dismisses it as almost uneventful and almost with a, something of a smirk uh, in his snarky kind of style. He decides to approach it this way. He said, well, uh, they did that, uh, something to the effect that they did that because I put sanctions on Russia because of their invasion of Ukraine. Well, I want to think about putting sanctions on the hackers. Ha ha, yuck, yuck. You know, you, now, however, the DNC establishment need a narrative to explain how it's possible that Hillary could have lost such a carefully rigged election. Oh yeah, coming out bits and pieces. Where do you get the whole picture there? And find out just how much fraud the DNC had put in place to, uh, to steal this election on their part. Well, they have to come up with some kind of a cover story here. They gotta divert attention. You'll notice that they kind of began to back off this election fraud tampering thing, this investigation into uh, hacking into the computers. They were looking at that a little while. All of a sudden, did you notice they turn away from that and began to back off? <laughs> yeah, well, I think we have a pretty good idea about why, and some, some things are surfacing to suggest what was going on there. They had their hands, they were up to their neck in election fraud. So now they need a cover story to explain how it is that Hillary could possibly have lost this election. And uh, so they've landed on the, uh, the Ruskies done it story. All right? Yeah. They kind of fell back on a Benghazi uh, style cover up. Right? You know how they use the movie made them do it ruse to turn our attention away from what was really going on in Benghazi the betrayal of our ambassador there, the betrayal of this country that had been going on. Through Benghazi for a while, by the way, um, funneling uh, arms to ended, ended up into the hands of ISIS. Well, they didn't need that to come out before Obama was trying to get reelected, now did they? So they came up with this story that the movie made them do it. It's interesting what's developing in Russia right now. I mean, let's, let's talk for a moment about what is of real concern to us. It's not hacking the DNC, let me tell you that. In fact, we probably ought to send them a thank you note, right? We should ask Russia if they can help us with some other uh, areas where certain people in our government are hiding the truth from us. 
maybe the Russians could help us get to the truth about some other issues. Because all the Russians ended up doing was showing us the corrupt underbelly of the Democratic Party. But more on that just a little bit. Let's talk about what's going on in Russia that should really be of concern to us. Uh, since all my life experience with liberals is that they have always had a kind of love relationship with Russia. Uh, and I think many of them secretly lamented, I saw some indications of this when it happened when the, fall, when the wall came down. Uh, many of the liberals were, were disturbed by that and lamented the fall of the wall. In fact, back in the day, the Prague's treated Russia in a way very similar to how many of them today treat the Muslims, you know. <laughs> They've always been fond of dictatorships. You'll notice that in many of the things that they say. And especially those that murder millions of people but manage somehow to maintain a heroic persona in their countries. You know, like Lenin, Stalin, Pol Pot, Ho Chi Minh, Fidel, Hitler, not so much. Now, Hitler really uh, doesn't get a lot of praise from these people. Uh, that's interesting, isn't it? When they like Stalin and Lenin and Pol Pot, Ho Chi Minh, some of these other mass murdering uh, criminals. Uh, we don't, we don't have pictures, you see, of Stalin's massacres, or of Pol Pot's massacres, or of Fidel's massacres, for that matter. Uh, or at least we don't have uh, the situation where those pictures are brought up into our faces like, like Auschwitz is, you see. Uh, the pictures from Auschwitz and some of the other uh, uh, concentration camps where they killed and murdered Jews by the thousands. Uh, I think something like six million when he got done. And so many others as well, by the way. So... We, and we don't have uh, um, an activist group w representing the people that Stalin killed or the people that Pol Pot killed or the people that Ho Chi Minh killed. So we don't have activist groups that have organized uh, and, and have worked and labored to keep, uh, to raise the consciousness of the entire world to the atrocities that were perpetrated against those people. So they don't have a voice speaking for them. Uh, nobody speaks for the millions that that Stalin killed. Nobody speaks for the millions that Pol Pot killed. Nobody speaks for the millions that Ho Chi Minh killed. Uh, it's, it's quashed. Uh, so, as a consequence, those guys continue in history with this kind of heroic persona. And the, uh, the liberals really like that, don't they? It's interesting, isn't it? But the truth is, Ho Chi Minh, Stalin, Pol Pot, these guys, they make Hitler look like a schoolboy. Now, of course, Trump has had his moments where he's... Uh, slipped into this thing of praising butchers himself, Saddam Hussein. You know, uh, he said that Saddam Hussein ought not to have been destabilized. <laughs> what a ridiculous thing to say. I think we did a little more than destabilize Hussein. <laughs> Off with his head is where that went. Uh, it, it, he was hung for his war crimes. Uh, what kind of a word is that for what happened in Iraq? Destabilized? And why? What's that about? Well, the reason that uh, Trump does not think that we should have destabilized Iraq is because while he was a really bad guy, Trump told us, he was a really bad guy, but he did one thing well. He killed terrorists. I hope you're listening to this stuff and pay attention. because We, we need to pray that God will help that man uh, come around and we'll get some sense about some of these things. Some more, his moral compass just sort of wobbles around and points different directions and it, it's hard to kind of get a feel and a sense of just where he is in terms of his, the way he thinks in, with regard to morality. All right? Because, uh, you know, I guess so what? So long as that Baghdad butcher was killing Kurds, you know, and other non-essential appendages to the body politic of Iraq, well, that's no problem. Because after all, he did a good job of killing terrorists, right? You see what I mean? What's that about? And of course, when Putin kills journalists, silences his political foes, wait a minute here. Is there real evidence that Putin has put a muzzle on freedom of, of the press in Russia? Well, I don't have time to go into detail. Uh, there's a long list of, of incidents that would support that allegation. Let me give you one story. Soon after Putin got into office in 2000, Russian officials, authorities, raided the offices of the major television network in Russia called MTV. And they arrested its owner, Vladimir Guzinski. 
and they alleged he had committed fraud. Now, interestingly, all of these charges were dropped. No proof was ever put forward, by the way, to support those charges. And then all of those charges suddenly disappeared once Gusinski agreed to sell his independently, privately owned media empire to the state-controlled company in Russia. All right, you take it from there, figure it out. You're not dumb. I know there's quite a love fest going on right now with Putin, and uh, I get it. And we've all, all of us, me included, we've laughed at the leg hiking contest that goes on between Putin and Obama over the last eight years or so. Obama's bomb genes, right? And then the Lily Putin's contrived justification for occupying Ukraine. You don't remember your, your Gulliver? Oh, Jonathan Swift, you know, his political satire, Gulliver's Travels. It offers many lessons rele relevant to the comedy of modern politics, let me tell you. The Lilliputians war with the Blefuscans over which end of the egg uh, you should use to begin peeling one boiled. Essentially, the, it, it represents to me the demagoguery of cultural animosities that are often almost irrelevant in order to advance some political agenda. You know, like Russia trumping up some specious argument to justify a military takeover of Ukraine, because really what they want is access to their port. And they desire to test, perhaps, the waters for a resurgence of the Soviet Empire. What's going on there? You might like turning your attention away from Lily Putin's model of democratic dictatorship. Well, I'm not so inclined. Uh, I'm uneasy with Trump's seemingly friendly attitude toward Putin. And I would remind him that it's dangerous to trust implicitly any bear, even one that's supposed to be trained. When I visited Russia one year with my son, we came across one of these guys, there are many of them in Russia, they have a trained bear. And so I was a little wary of it, but they convinced me to let my son go over, he was about 12 years old, somewhere in the 13, to go over there and stand by the bear. We get a picture, we got the picture. But uh, the bear uh, began getting a little bit aggressive with my son and kind of grabbed him and started pawing him and hitting him with his paws. So, of course, the trainer stepped in, my son walked away. But listen, you don't trust a Russian bear. Not even a trained one. <laughs> Unless you're thinking about uh, uh, his training with KGB, you know, uh, Putin's training in the KGB, perhaps that's, uh, maybe he is a trained bear after all. Hmm. From scripture we know that the bear is going to rise and one side will be higher than the other. A prophetic representation of the combination of the Persians and the Median empires or, or, or cultures or peoples. And that would be Iran and the area we know of as Russia. And some would include China in that, by the way. Russia, Iran, and China. Uh, some think, and I, and I believe with some legitimate uh, basis, uh, that uh, these are the three ribs that the prophet Daniel shows are in the mouth of the bear, and the three ribs that will call out to the bear to arise and devour much flesh. That's a, an alliance, by the way, China, Russia, Iran. That's an alliance that Nixon was particularly concerned about back in his day. It's an alliance we all should be concerned about. Um, and we see uh, movements in that direction, which should be concerning to all of us. Now, my own interest in the spiritual intrigues and uh, the demonic machinations that are active behind the scenes and, uh, and moving developments in the direction they are going in Russia, in Iran, in China, notwithstanding. And my concerns about, uh, about Russia's uh, aggressive behavior in Ukraine and elsewhere, by the way, um, these things notwithstanding, the fact is, this business of Russia hacking our election is bogus nonsense. <laughs> it's just foolishness. It's a total red herring. It's definitely a false flag. It's something we have, it's just ridiculous. And it's so politically motivated. First of all, uh, they didn't hack the election, right? You know this already. Let me go over it real quick. They didn't hack the election. That is, they didn't go into the computers where we 
tab tabulate all the results and so on and manipulate the numbers in some way to create a different outcome than what would be represented if the votes were counted honestly. That's not what they did. Uh, there's no proof for that. In fact, when they started looking into that, they got a little funny and began crawfishing, began backing away. I think it's because when they went into that, they found out that the other side was doing that. And uh, I think there are millions of people that voted that should not have been voting and so on. And th th those people voted for Hillary in the main. So I think Trump's victory was um, just nothing short of a miracle. In any event, also when honest men have looked into this and evaluated uh, the so-called evidence that the CIA says that they have supporting this, well, they, you know, they come back and say well, there's really no evidence. If there was, we would have heard about it by now. Uh, they're busy trying to manufacture the evidence is what they're doing. Uh, second, you know, what about the CIA? The CIA has told us that, that uh, this has happened, that they have evidence to prove it. Really? But they can't show it, you know. Yeah, that, that's probably one of the funniest parts of this whole stupid little game that these guys are playing. I mean, if it were not so serious, I think we'd just laugh it off. The CIA? Are you kidding me? The CIA is designed to specialize in disinformation. I mean, that's their thing, man. Clandestine operations using lies, misdirection, Machiavellianistic kind of tactics. Intrigue is their thing, man. That's their forte. If we're supposed to trust them. I mean, there's a good reason that they're supposed to not be involved in domestic issues. We don't want that kind of organization operating within the United States, uh, the domestic concerns and issues of the American people. Good night. We're supposed to trust them? You know, it's going to be interesting to see what goes down when Trump does finally get into the Oval Office and reaches his hands into uh, the CIA's business. Uh, we'll see. That'll be interesting. And as I've said uh, in my opening, all the progs, including their inside man of the right, John McCain, continue to do all they can to convince us that it's Russia's alleged interference in our recent election they kept Hillary out of the White House. It's their cover story for their failure there. Uh, and, and the outrage over this is really just comical. I have, I have a question for McCain. Uh, where's your outrage over Obama's interference into Israel's election when he was trying to uh, stick his hands into that election and uh, keep Netanyahu from being reelected? What about that? Uh, why isn't that uh, something you're real concerned about? You know? And then, Mr. McCain, with regard to this Benghazi thing, you were all up in arms, along with the rest of us, and I think rightly so, and I was proud of you when you stood up about that and called that a cover-up and, and uh, pointed your finger at Hillary and even Obama. And, uh, and, but then all of a sudden, whenever uh, rumblings about impeachment began to boil up over that issue of Benghazi, all of a sudden, you went yellow. Yeah, you turned your back, you tucked your tail, you ran away like a little puppy. They got barked at. Well, who barked at you? You say, I wonder about you, fella. I don't understand that kind of stuff. Um, he should have been impeached for that, and Hillary ought to be in jail, and so on. But, that, okay, more on that another time. Um, I, I, when I look at this situation with McCain getting all hot about this uh, Russia hacking the DNC, right? And he's not even talking about the Pentagon and the Homeland Security, so far as I can tell. Uh, he's looking at this hacking our election thing. What's that about? He's just playing along with the MSM, playing along with Obama, uh, going along with him on this whole thing. And the outrage is comical. Now, I don't think McCain's interest in this is orchestrated by the left, except in the way that he usually is with Mr. McCain, for some reason. Uh, and you know... I, you've noticed it. I know that I have. He's always been a media hound. It's, it's, and these guys, they need the, the, the name recognition, and so I, I, I get that in some measure. But, you know, he's easily manipulated by the MSM. He despises Trump. I mean, look, understand something. He's insulted, right? The American people rejected him in his bid for the presidency, and they accepted Trump? That lowbrow character? Is, and in preference to a hero like McCain, I mean, you know, McCain's outraged over that. I, I think that's where the real uh, animus is, uh, is at in McCain's attitude here and what really is behind him getting into this up to his neck. Uh, but anyway, uh, I've run out of my time.
I don't want to talk to you about the Black Lives Matter thing. I, I'm going to come back to that in another, in another video clip, all right? Frankly, I'm just not feeling well. I've been battling this cold. Mercy, it's hanging on to me. Uh, so I appreciate your prayers for me. And, uh, and our church is going into revival services with uh, David McCracken uh, beginning tomorrow. And I'd like to be up for that and for this week. Always look forward to having Brother McCracken with us. He's a great man of God, and I appreciate his ministry here at Lighthouse Baptist Church. So let me sign off by saying, God bless you. God save America. And I'll see you in church. <laughs>